Greetings, saints of the Most High God, all my father's children. To you I say the Lord bless you. Welcome back to another in our Bible study series. And we are continuing on the topic, walking in the word. We have been going through some things and we started to dig a little bit deeper and we are going to go a little bit further, deeper yet, as we drill down so that we can clearly and properly establish how crucial it is that we, first of all, understand the importance of the word and also the importance of walking in the word. Our spiritual life literally depends upon it. Our lives depend upon timely, conscientiously digging into the word, reading it, studying it, having it forming a part of our literal being so that in time to come, the Spirit of Almighty God working with us can pull from what is inside of us and use it to guide and to direct in times of need. Also, just to have the word so that it can provide light to direct our path. It is very important. And we have made the statement and have expressed how crucial it is for children of God if they are intent on being successful, if they are intent, if we are intent on advancing and overcoming continuously, constantly, there has to be that understanding that the word is a critical staple in our advancing in God, in our walking a victorious life as a Christian. I, I believe, because I have seen it, I do believe that there are many of God's children who are living beneath where they are supposed to be. Many of God's children living beneath and below their privilege simply because they do not know. And there is absolutely no excuse there is absolutely nothing that can be given to justify or not knowing or not appreciating or not understanding some of the rudimentary things in terms of what it is that the lord require of us as we walk with him we stated over and over that the Lord magnifies his word above his very name. And that was a critical plank, uh, an important basis upon which we establish the crucial nature of us appreciating and embracing and holding on to an understanding and living in the word of God because God treasures his word and if God treasure his word in the way that he has and elevate it and have it at a pedestal above his very name it means brothers and sisters that the words of almighty God means and ought to mean everything to us we therefore, to our peril, at our own risk, treat the word of God lightly. To our own detriment, we treat the word of God with disdain. Uh, it scares me, and I'm being very honest with all of us. I am scared at the rate at which I observe, just generally, just a cursory look across Christianity, Christendom in general, 
when I look and survey and see how folks uh, treat the word of God with scant regard, how I see folks trample the things that are clearly delineated in the word so that we can be guided by certain things, we can walk in a particular way based on what another aspect or another part of the word clearly stipulate there are some things that we must avoid based on what the word of God is saying and I observe folks running headlong into the very things that the Lord would want us to avoid and it makes me as an individual wonder how is it that the word which is so potent and powerful the word which is so highly esteemed in the heavenlies where God dwells by God Almighty himself. How is it that as children of God we can treat it so lightly? And so I am very concerned. But I'm also um, happy at the fact that as people of God we have the capacity when the things are brought to our attention. And I'm also very happy at who God is that he is so long-suffering that once we recognize our shortcoming and we realize that we are not walking according to the light of God's word, but we then make the decision to turn around and to align ourselves or realign ourselves with the word of Almighty God. I'm happy that the God that we serve is full of mercy, full of compassion, He's long-suffering. And once we decide to realign ourselves and walk according to and walk in the word, the thing about the God that we serve is that he put the past behind and he focused on where we are and what we are intent on doing. And so my word of encouragement right now to every child of God is that we move to put ourselves to take some time off get down into some fasting and prayer and get up out of that devotion with a new strength and energy and plan and a new vision to move out walking in the word we have gone through what we have for the last couple of weeks so that we can be clear in our minds that when it comes to the scriptures when it comes to the word of almighty god we have tried to present to us how important it is that we embrace this word we cannot I say again, we cannot and we will not advance as children of God if we treat the word of God lightly. We will not overcome. We will be victims instead of victors. And so I impress upon every saint of God, I impress upon every child of God, to all my father's children, that we must take seriously the things that are contained in the book that we must love the word walk in the word and do everything as best as we can because by getting into the word and digging into the word the knowledge that comes from that will provide the necessary light and without this knowledge we become fools, we act as fools, we do the thing that fools do, and we must be careful. Whilst God might save fools, he doesn't keep them. And what is going to have us matriculating into higher heights is our embracing and living the words of Almighty God. That's right. And without that knowledge, God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge so that not having the knowledge is not going to be an excuse where God is going to say I will pardon you I will 
put you aside. I will treat with you different simply because you never know. When there are some things that we ought to know and the Lord expects us to know, then there is going to be no excuse for that. And therefore, folks are going to be destroyed. And the writer couldn't be any plainer when he stated it as such. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So we are here and we are sharing and we are moving to allow us to build the knowledge base. I really want us to understand. And so far we are seeing how crucial it is to have the word. We are seeing what the absence of the word does. We are seeing the mode of operation of Satan. And when we met last week, we examined the two scriptures because we learned some things from those scriptures that I, I, I believe a lot of folks did not know before. And it is good when we can shine light Yes, to the upright daily. It is good when we can have a newer or a clearer revelation of a particular matter because it then helps us to absorb and to embrace and to meditate on those things to the extent that we can move and we can make adjustments and then we can align ourselves properly. We can then safeguard ourselves against the onslaught of the enemy. And I thank God for his word because it is this very word, it is this very book, it is this very scripture that we from time to time, day by day, week by week as we go through different aspects, daily we read, for some weekly or bi-weekly or monthly we study. And whatever it is we do, we do it on a consistent basis. And once we are consistent, we are going to find that the Lord works with us in a particular way. And we then build and build and go higher and higher and simultaneously deeper and deeper, if we understand what I mean when I say deeper. And so it is very important. Just for a quick review, um, and then we push ahead. We, when we met last week, we looked at the scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. And I will have it on the screen for us because I'm going to just have us to read it again and quickly run through so that I can rehearse what we discussed last week. So you are seeing this on your screen, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. Put on, and Paul was speaking to the church over there at Ephesus, and he was advising them what they ought to do because he was very clear on the mode of operation, the modus operandi of Satan himself, the devil himself. So Paul said to the church that was over there at Ephesus in chapter 6 and verse 11 of the book, he said, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that was a very, very important admonition by the apostle Paul to the Ephesians. Note that last part of the verse. It said that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we outlined to us when we last met that the word wiles is taken from the Greek word methodos, M-E-T-H-O-D-O-S. And it is a compound of the word meta and odos. Yes, meta simply means with, and odus means a road. So that when we put them together to get the word methodus or methodus, it simply means with a road or on a particular road. Yes, so that plainly tells us that the enemy, the devil, is traveling along a particular road. A critical part of his operation, his mode, is to move along a particular road. 
he traverses a particular pattern and this is a critical part of his mode of operation yes traversing going down a going along going with a particular road and that road that pattern goes somewhere the question brothers and sisters is where does this road lead and it is when we look at another scripture where Paul in writing again to believers at the church at Corinth in 2nd Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 we get a sense easily of where this road that the devil is walking on that the devil is traversing we get a clear understanding of of where this road leads and 2nd Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 Paul in writing to the Corinthians warning them admonishing them he said lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices so that here is another word we just looked at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 and we see he's warning them against the wiles of the devil and we broke down that word wiles we looked at its Greek origin and we broke down the Greek word and we see ultimately where that word methodos simply means along a particular road traversing a particular road traversing a particular avenue signaling that the adversary constantly uh, go along a certain method a certain trajectory a certain road a certain pattern and this road this pattern of him going down a particular road uh, leads to a particular place here it is that Paul is writing to the Corinthians and telling them for we are not ignorant of his intention of his device and we are now saying that that very word that is uh, that from which the word device comes is a word that is very important that we also be clear on yes that word device is from the Greek word no matter n-o-e-m-a-t-a the -E -A -A, very diligent now since as you look closely and you probably make notes there and i did say that at the end we will be putting all of these together you will have them but do make your notes so that greek word from which we get the word devices is no matter and it is derived from a word another greek word n-o-u-s nos that word nos is the very word from which we get mind or the intellect yes and that is important understand that the word from which we get mind or intellect the only thing though is that when paul wrote to the corinthians in second corinthians 2 and verse 11 that word mind carries the idea of a deceived mind yes so paul was saying that be careful for we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil or we are not ignorant of the fact that he's trying to deceive us in our minds yes that is what is being implied there so that when we put Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 with the understanding that we have derived from it and when we look at 2nd Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 with the what we have derived from that also we are seeing where the adversary is traversing a particular road that always is leading to our minds or our intellect because clearly there is something that he knows that you and I might be taking for granted and 
we are bringing it right before our eyes again this evening so that we can be clear that Satan, the adversary of the believer, the accuser of the brethren, is constantly going along a particular pathway, along a particular avenue, along a particular road that ultimately leads to the mind of the believer in an attempt to capture the mind and to cause his thoughts and his wiles and his arrows to penetrate the mind to the extent that he can take control of the mind. If he takes control of the mind, he moves to set up what is called strongholds. And he does this in the minds. You, he cannot set up a stronghold, a physical stronghold around any saint of God. He cannot set up a, a material, so to speak, stronghold against a saint of God. You will find that very many folks try to do things to physically undermine the, the saint of God. And you will find saints just walk through traps easily. Physical things are not easily planted and plotted against a saint of God. So, so what you will see happening is saints just going on their way. People set traps. These things happen. And saints somehow get through them. And folks wonder. And the devil knows this. So what he does where the saint of God is concerned is that he constantly traverses a particular roadway and try at the end of it to captivate and to capture and to penetrate our minds. So as Paul wrote further, to the, the brethren at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, you will see where he says to them, listen, church, casting down imaginations, because this is what the adversary does. He tried to penetrate and control the mind, the intellect, and all kind of things when that happened come to mind. We start to think particular ways about our brother. We start to think particular ways about our sisters. We start to think particular ways about the church of God itself. We start to think particular ways about leadership. We start to think particular ways about the choir. We start to think all kinds. We start to think particular ways about our wives or our husbands or our workplace our schools, our teachers, and all kind of things. But for that to happen, the adversary, Satan, has to take or have to take control of our minds. So Paul, in giving a word of advice, is saying to the church, casting down imaginations. Imaginations come about as a result of how we allow the mind to move from one place to the other. Bear that in mind. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Yes, and he then go on further to say to them, and bringing into captivity every thought. Why would Paul be admonishing this church? To bring into captivity every thought. He clearly knows the power of the mind. He clearly knows the power of the thought. And if left unchecked, the mind and the thoughts that it imagines will bring a saint of God into subjection. The person who have the stronghold and bring them into that subjection will be none other than Satan himself, the accuser of the brethren. So Paul is saying, listen, saints, if you are going to be an overcomer, you know, if you are going to be a Christian, you know, if you are going to walk with Almighty God, you have got to be clear in your understanding that you have got to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against God because this is what a, a mind that is captured by Satan does. We think and try to belittle the things that will elevate God. A person who undermines the word 
constantly, even though the word of God is something that he exalts and hold in a high and holy place. And yet by virtue of how the mind is operating, folks will take the word of God. Let us use Bible today in term, instead of the actual word. Folks will take their Bibles and park it and have it at the back gathering dust. Folks will take up books and want something to write on and open their Bible and scribble all kind of notes in it about everything else that they can go back to it to get telephone number. If you ever know what the things that people do with the Bible, it, it kind of gives us a sense of, the, of how we elevate or how we embrace or the, the value that we place on this book that contains the word of God. And we must be very careful. And so Paul said to the church, and every thought must be brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Or are you going to obey Christ? You first got to know the word. You've got to know what Christ says in the word so that you can obey it. If you don't know the word, if we don't know the word, we can't obey the word. If we don't know what Christ said, we cannot obey Christ. So Paul, these three scriptures that we have just read have given us a mouthful have given us a big mouthful in terms of how we ought to be clear as to the critical importance, the critical importance of having the word of God embedded in our hearts, in our minds. It is extremely, extremely important. We cannot overemphasize. We cannot state it any more, any clearer, sorry. We cannot punch it any harder. The devil is after us and he's coming to captivate and to control our minds because if he has that, and we are going to be digging into some other scriptures. And we are going to be looking at how Satan operates even deeper. And we are going to be looking at the very term devil. And break down that term and see what it means. And we will realize that the thing that I'm telling you is not anything that is made up by me, saints of God. This is word. This is book. This is scripture, and we need to understand that. So if we did not know the depths of how Satan operates to cause us to put aside the word and to undermine the word and to belittle the word, we need to understand what is at play. And I'm telling us, and this is how we operate. If he controls your mind, if he controls my mind, I declare to us right now that he controls us. He will control our emotion. He will control our bodies. He controls our health. Some people, because of the things that they focus on, and even science have corroborated this, that a mind that is sick can ultimately cause a body to be sick. Yes? A mind that constantly thinks negative things can cause somebody's emotion to be broken down. We need to understand the power of the mind and we need to be clear and to understand the mode of operation of Satan, his strategy. And I said it before, you and I are in warfare. We are in spiritual warfare. Some of us are living as if that is not true. And we have seeded grounds and we have given up territories because we are just going through the motion and don't realize that there is a devil. There is Satan that hates us. And we cannot treat lightly our walk with God. So we are going through and we are walking and we have our Bibles in our hands and we are coming to church. And that is so very good. But we have got to go many steps beyond that. And we have got to understand first the depth of Satan and what he's trying to do. 
but we must be even clearer on the depth of the word of God and the depth of who God is and understand that he has already wrought the victory when he died on the cross. So victory is there. But we must move to walk into that victory. And I want to illustrate this with a little um, episode from a real life scenario. And this is someone was relating this. Uh, this is someone that was in the United States of America relating this. And a vehicle was going along the country road one night. Uh, in those, along those country roads, you have deers. That animal, they call the deer. They, they live in the bushes. So as the suburban townships expand, they go further and further into the forests and, you know, get into the way of life, into the habitat of the animals. So they have these suburban homes going through I think it might have been in New York, the upstate, and going through the area that was the habitat of the deers. And one night, this gentleman was driving on his way home, and he hit a deer, and the deer went over, fell on the ground. Uh, for whatever reason, the gentleman came out of his vehicle, saw that the deer was hit, didn't try to, was yet still alive, he realized, he tied the feet of the deer together. Apparently he wanted to take him. I don't know if he was going to take him to the hospital, the pet hospital, or he was going to take him home since he was still alive to have a sumptuous meal, but he tied him up there. Whatever the reasons were, he had to leave. I don't know if another vehicle came, whatever it was. I'm not clear on that, but he ended up leaving the, 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 the deer there. It was the next day that passers-by, as they drove by, saw the deer on the ground with his feet tied up. So nearby was a little farm, and they eventually found out that the deer you know, lived in the outskirts of the farm. That farmer came over, saw the deer in the predicament, and loosed him. And no matter how they hit that deer and told the deer to get up. Get up, man. Get up. As they push it up, it fell back on the ground. Apparently, that deer tried to get up before when his feet were tied. And he realized that he could not get up. And that happened right through the night. So the deer was now convinced he couldn't walk. When that farmer came down the morning and saw the deer in that predicament, he pulled that cord that had bound the feet of the deer. And having pulled it, he expected the deer to, the deer to jump up and go now, but the deer wouldn't move. And no matter how he hit the deer and pushed and said, go, go, get up, shoot, go, the deer wouldn't move. You know what happened? The deer had it registered in its mind that his feet were still bound. And no matter what that man did, once the mind was captivated, once the mind said that I am bound, that deer would never get up because his mind was captivated. There was a stronghold in his mind. He's bound. Another farmer came, saw what was happening and said, this deer needs help because there is a stronghold in his mind. That farmer lift him up, put him on his feet, still holding him, and then let him go. So the deer just automatically stood up. So all of a sudden, the deer realized now that he was standing. How is this? I'm on my feet. It registered in his mind. Two twos, one slap, know that he was on his feet. His mind was now clear that he was standing on his feet. The deer ran off. Stop him two times, and he ran off. What was happening? He now knew. He now had a new mindset. He now recognized that he was standing. 
his mind was renewed. His mind was now changed. His mind was now transformed. That mind controlled the very action of the deer. In as much as his fetters were loosed, he was still going around as if he was bound. Because his mind told him that he was bound until the other farmer came, placed him on his feet, held him up there for a while. The strength came back. His mind is now clear that he is free. And he slapped him and told him to go. The power of the mind. The very thing happens to us, brothers and sisters. We are talking about the word. We are talking about the mind. Without the things from the word being fed into the mind to direct the kind of people that we should be. And I'm coming back to that because this is where ultimately we are going. The power of the word is going to resonate from our systems when we are clear as to what and how it works. It all works through the mind. And we will see what Paul said as we went through. Now listen to how Satan, knowing that this is how we are as human beings, knowing that this is our construct, listen to how and watch how Satan operates. When we looked at 1 Samuel chapter 17 last week, we, dwe we dwelt on verse 11 for a short while. In verse 11, it said, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they heard the word, and it therefore registered in their minds. And having heard and having had this thing registering in their minds, having the thing registering in their minds, the Bible said they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So they heard, and let me just, I might interject here. The things that we hear, the things that we see, have a way to impact how we put things together, how we assimilate things, how we work things out in our minds. The things that we hear, the, this gate and this gate, have a big impact on the mind. Hence the reason that we must be very careful of the things that we constantly and allow to flood into our ears, brothers and sisters, Hence the reason why we must be very careful of what we allow to flood into our eyes, which means the things that we watch, which means the things that we read, which means the things that we allow folks or the radio or whatever it is to constantly pour through our ears into our system. Our ears and our eyes are doors that gets into the heart of a man right into the very mind. Bear in mind that it is with the mind that we serve God. It is with the mind that we have a concept of who God is. We can picture God because of our mind. None of us have ever seen him, but all of us, if I am not, and I don't think I'm wrong, at some point of conceptualize what Jesus looks like. Sometimes when we are having communion service, I might say to folks, picture him on the cross. And all of a sudden, two, three, four, five, six hundred people have their minds working, picturing him. And we, are, we even reach the point where we picture his face. All of us have a particular perspective of what his face is like. But that only can happen when we utilize our minds. And this is why the Bible, when it says it is with the mind that we serve God, because we are able to conceptualize, we are able to discern, we are able to put into certain perspective things about God 
-hmm. by virtue of the mind. The mind, therefore, is the control center. It is what we use to serve God. Hence the reason, brothers and sisters, why the devil always attacks us at the mind. He knows that it is the spiritual nerve center, so to speak. He knows that it is the control center of the body. It, it, it is that place where the physical and the spiritual somehow comes together in a particular way so that words and things that we read and things that we watch uh, come together in the mind and then the mind puts it in a particular place. We can either set up a stronghold against ourselves if we allow the devil to have the preeminence or we can by virtue of this mind and what comes to this mind, we can set up a positive enclave where the God of heaven through the, his spirit have free course and is elevated. And then we therefore can move to further worship and serve and minister to God through this mind. So this mind can be the place where negative things and a negative stronghold bring us down and hold us into captivity and have us under subjection or the mind can be a clear space that is free and open and fertile for the spirit of God to impart a word and we then have our release and can move and advance in things pertaining to the kingdom of God. This mind and we must be very careful of that. No, hence the reason why Goliath could spew out words and the people of Israel became dismayed and afraid because they constantly heard it and it got a hold of their minds and they automatically became afraid. They weren't, the Bible didn't say that they became afraid because of how big Goliath was. Yes, he was nine feet, nine tall, very imposing and they might have been afraid of that. But when we look at the scripture in verse 11 of 1 Samuel 17, we are seeing that the things that he said is what caused them to be really dismayed and afraid. So words have a way of playing on somebody. You and I can say something about a person and you would be amazed, brothers and sisters, to know what those words, those words can be venomous, those words can be poisonous those words can be so hard and cold and callous and caustic that you and i will be amazed at the horrors that the things that we say can have on the life of a person a saint of god and this brings it out in first samuel 17 and verse 11 the words what they heard caused them to be dismayed and to be afraid, be careful of the things. We're coming to the practical part, and I keep saying that, but don't we worry about it. If I say we're coming there, we're going to get there. But these middle parts are crucial because I want to establish a basis for the things that I'm going to be saying then so that people can understand, so that all of us can understand that we're not just talking of, out of our heads. Did you know that when God tells us not to do a particular thing, it's not because he's exerting his authority and saying, I am God so I can tell you to do what I want and you better do it? No. When God tells us not to do a particular thing, he knows the danger of the thing. And because of the danger that it can have on you, the person, or on another saint, he said, don't do it. But many of us don't know. And so we're using Bible study in terms of walking in the word to open up our understanding so that we can see the things when God said, don't do a particular thing. Or he says, do a particular thing. He knows because he is God, the impact that it will have. It can either have a positive impact or it can have a negative impact. And when God said, do a thing, he knows the positive impact that it will have, both on you and on others. And many times when God said to do a thing, we don't do it. On another instance, the Lord said, don't do a thing, because he knows the negative impact. And, we, and when he said, don't do it, we do it. And when the negative results come, then all of a sudden, it is woe. And it is, God, where are you? Where are you, God? 
And we don't even realize that we're not walking in the Word. So we're going through these things so that we can be clear and we can see how and why God does and says some of the things that He says because He knows the impact. And we are seeing it from the Word, the impact that it has on people. Now, listen to how Satan works. And I want us to look at verse 16 of this same 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to look at that verse, and then we're going to relate it to exactly who Satan is. We're going to see some things jumping at us. So verse 16 said, And the Philistine, talking about Goliath, drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Morning and evening, and presented himself 40 days. Digest that saints of God. Every day, every day, every morning, every evening, for one week. Every morning. Every evening, two weeks. Every morning, every evening, three weeks. Every morning, every evening. Remember, no, no, this is every single day for 40 days, non-stop. It's a constant bombardment. And this is extremely important that, you know, if we don't read the words or if we just, in a cursory way, brothers and sisters go through, we are going to miss a whole lot. The book, the Bible, which is the word of God, has innumerable treasures for us. We see and we learn. And, and the Apostle Paul told us, you know, that the things that were written were written for our admonition, you know, so that we don't fall into the same traps and we, we can safeguard ourselves from going along the way that those of old went. They were dear and written and given to us so that we can learn from them. We can align ourselves with the Bible, with the book, and learn the circumstances in many instances, brothers and sisters, are the same. And we need to understand that. So here it is that the Philistine showed himself to Israel every day for 40 days, morning and evening. Very significant. Constant bombardment. Constant bombardment. They're hearing it in the morning. They're hearing it in the night. And it is important that we realize that this method of Goliath, where he was bombarding them and hitting them, hitting them, hitting them, day and night, day and night, he knew the adversary, the devil, was working through Goliath. Make no mistake about it. And that is how Satan works. And we need to understand. I'm going to show us. Do we know what the, de the word devil means? Do we know how it is? I'm going to put the slide up. And the first slide, I'm going to just go through it right now. And I'm putting it on the screen. Because I want us to use that and reflect on what we just read in 1 Samuel's chapter 17 and verse 16. Now, I want us to see and understand what the name devil, the adversary, the one that is the accuser of the brethren, brothers and sisters, Satan himself, that old dragon. I want us to understand what the term devil means. Now, the name devil is derived from the Greek word diabolos. Yes? And it is a compound of two words. Dia, 
and balo right when they when they are joined together when those when it is compounded you get the word diabolos and that's that greek word from which we get devil now dia the word dia carries the idea of penetration you're pushing through and constant the beating trying to penetrate right that greek word dia carries the idea of penetration follow me closely the word balo means to throw something such as a ball or a, or a stone all right and and it is important that we see that so again just to recap that little part that i've just said let me take it from the top again the word devil yes the word devil is derived from the greek word diabolos bear that in mind take your time and it is a compound of the words dia and balo right dia carries the idea of penetration and the word balo means to throw something such as a ball or you know a stone uh, a javelin whatever so literally now brethren the word diabolos which is the word from which we get devil describes the repetitive action of hitting something again and again and again until finally the wall or the membrane is so worn down that it can be completely and thoroughly penetrated. I want you to be I want you to bear that in mind. So that the devil, the devil, next slide, the devil is the one who strikes repeatedly repeatedly again and again until he breaks down a person's mental resistance yes until he breaks down a person's mental resistance and once that resistance has been breached the enemy then strikes with all his fury to take captive the person's mind and emotion. And brothers and sisters, that is what devil means. Most folks didn't know that. Most folks are totally unaware of what the term devil means and where it is derived from. It is derived from the word diabolus. Diabolus, and we need to understand that he is that person who strikes repeatedly again and again and again. His intention is to break down a person's mental resistance. And once that resistance has been breached, the enemy then strikes with all his fury to take captive person's mind and emotion that is exactly what and this is why we know that behind Goliath as he stood there in front of the armies of Israel defying them and defying almighty God it was Satan that was at work it was the devil that was at work because every day for 40 days morning and evening Constantly at it, punching in the word, punching in the word, breaking down their resistance, breaking down their minds, and it was working. Yes, it was. And I'm going to relate, and this is how wicked the adversary is. This is why, brothers and sisters, when we talk about the word, when we talk about getting into the word, the only remedy for that approach of Satan is to have the words of God dwelling richly in our 
hearts. And we're coming to those scriptures that will show us that this is exactly how it works. Any child of God who don't have the word richly in their hearts, it doesn't matter how long you have been around church, brother, sister, you are not going to be the overcoming Christian. There are some folks that are in the church and they, every single day, it is the same thing over and over. The same weakness, the same, dis the same disruption, the same failure, the same every single day. And we say, God, what is it that is happening? And we are saying the devil is strong. No, the devil is not strong. We have made ourselves weak. Because when the word should be dwelling richly in our hearts, we are doing everything else. We read everything else. We meditate on everything else. We watch everything else. And we do nothing that would cause the word to take a prominent place in our minds and in our hearts. Nothing works on autopilot. If a man gets married to a lady, the lady that he loves, the day that they get married and they say, oh, I have her now or I have him now and we are together and it has come to the climactic point of the relationship and we are now together, we have sealed it and we have put the rings on and we have said I do and we have consummated it and that's it. Any married couple that believes that that's it, after a year, or two, or six months, or one month, you're going to find that that's not really how it goes. It doesn't matter that you were passionately in love. It doesn't matter that she couldn't do anything wrong, or he was Prince Charming and what he said go. That's just how it is at the beginning. But if you're going to keep that, or if it is going to be kept together, you know, married folks, I know that it is going to require that we do some things to keep love alive. We know that there's going to be times when we have to say nice words. There going to, there's going to be times when we have to say, I love you. There are going to be times when we have to wrap up the dirty clothes and put them where they must go and all of those kind of things. There are going to be times when we have to get ourselves together and say, come, we're going to go out and have dinner over there. There are going to be things that we have to do. The absence of those things is going to make the foundation of a great marriage break down. The foundation will be eroded and the thing will wash away. We know that. It does not work on autopilot. The very thing is true for our relationship with God. So yes, we got saved at a particular time. We got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and we were baptized in water and we had our salvation experience and oh, the joy said I wouldn't tell it to a living soul, how I got salvation, and it made me whole. I said I wouldn't hide the love of Jesus in my heart, and we start to testify. It makes me laugh, and it makes me cry, and it set my sinful soul on fire. And I will never turn back, oh, never turn back. I've heard a lot of people declaring that, they, that in a song, never turn back again, for the road I am on is a heavenly one. And I'll never turn back again. And them backslide. Turn back. And some backslidden ones are still in church. Here in body. But their minds are not in church. They are backslidden. How is that? It's not on autopilot. Our walk with God has to be a daily walk. And there are some things that we have to do. Yes, we have to tell him too that I love you. But we have got to do some things that are spiritual things that will feed the spirit. And since we are talking about walking in the word, we are focusing on the word. And many of us 
to our detriment have neglected the word and are anemic and the foundations are washing away and we are only Christians by name, not by character and by action and by the things that we constantly, consistently do, only by name. But some folks have even left their marriage relationship and they only have a name. They still have the name, but they're not into the thing. Some folks leave Jesus Christ and they still have the name. Not, not there. No relationship. No fellowship. Because we're not in the world. Satan has successfully. And it's because some of these things, we, well, we, we, we're opening doors and revealing new things. And it's not new because these things were always there. But we are revealing the things to us so that we know without any shadow of a doubt the strategies that the devil is using to get at you and I. And we need to safeguard ourselves against this so that we can stand having done all to stand. And none of us brothers and sisters will be able to stand without solidly Walking, embracing, eating, digesting, marinating ourselves over the word. Or have the word marinating itself over us. None of us will stand. The word is a must. And the adversary, Satan, the devil is going to come beating, beating constantly, constantly. On our heart's door. On our mind. Yes? Until he sees a breakdown. Until he sees a, a, a weakening. Until he recognizes that something, a membrane is being broken down, is being softened. And when he sees that and he smells blood, he's going to come more ferocious and he's going to throw himself with fury right into your system with his thoughts. And we have to see if God against that. I want us to look at another slide right now because we're going right into it to show us some things. And we're going to go through this quickly. So if I'm going too fast as we go through this one, you just have to look at it again. But we're going to go through. So we look at the slide. And I want us to follow me carefully. Look how it works. You're going to find that uh, we can relate to this. Many folks have come and have asked me, Sir, I don't know what is happening. But things that used to, when I was unsaved, I was never a person that, um, since I got saved, wanted to test out you know, the alcoholic drink again. But all of a sudden, you know, I don't know what is happening. I, 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 I start to have a crave again for alcohol. No, I know so something is happening there. Because as we start talking, the, the diagnosis begins. And I'm diagnosing because I know exactly what is happening. And nothing is wrong for a person to, to, to express that that is happening to them. And that is where it all starts. Because some folks know that some things are going amiss. Some folks realize that they are now having an appetite for things that they used to have the appetite for when they were in the world. And they don't know why. And they say, Satan is so strong. And Satan will try to overpower me. But we are, we are looking at it like the glass is half empty. Because it's not that Satan is strong. It is... The fact that we are becoming weak. Why is that happening? Let us look at the slide and see what is at play here. All of us, as I was just saying, can relate to the fact that when we were just saved, it took some time to get over some of the emotional and mental scars that we receive while under the devil's control in the world, right? And, and that's a fact. We, we know that while the salvation experience was instant and a lot of the things that gripped us is as if they were moved out of our very sphere of existence and operation for those that were hooked on drugs we didn't even have the desire for drugs again for those that were hooked on alcohol didn't want another 
Smirnoff again, not another champ, um, Campari, ne not like that. No Johnny Walker Black, never feel for it again. Once we got saved, like, it's like the taste, the, the, the appetite for those things went, right? And we can understand that. After a while, af after a little while, sometimes they come back and we have to be seemingly fighting. But we generally get the upper hand once we stick to prayer and fasting and the word. But it doesn't mean that it takes a little while for some of the things to fully detach itself from us. And so we realize that although the inner man have been born again and made new, the mind and the body must still be conformed to the image of the inner man. So we realize as Paul goes on, and we're going to look at some of the scriptures that he have there, you will see him talking to people that are saved, you know, people that got baptized, people that got filled, people that received, got the born again experience. He's saying to them, listen man, you've got to have your mind renewed. But look here, no man, you've got to put away these kind of thinking. Listen to me, no man, over there. You've got to, whatsoever things are good, you have to think. And, and he's constantly, and we're going to look at some of the scriptures. Because he knows that even though we have the salvation, born again experience, there is a constant struggle with the mind. Because this is the seat of our control system, so to speak. It is with the mind that we serve God. So you can be clear that satan is going to attack this mind because he wants us not to serve god he's going to attempt to pollute the mind because if a polluted mind tries to serve a holy god it's not going to work and so sometimes we fall down but we get back up quickly and we say god wash god cleanse god purify and we start to serve him again however if we allow the adversary to capture and then captivate the mind and then plant into the mind the things that he wants to go in there, then he, little by little, is going to pollute the mind. And when he reaches that place where he pollutes the mind to the place where the mind can even become reprobate, because the Bible talks about a reprobate mind, and we realize that where Satan is pushing us, is to constantly inject and implant things into our mind, into our mental faculties, to the extent that we digress and move away and away and away from the Word of God. And if we move from the Word of God, we are literally moving away from God. This is how he works. So, look back. Perhaps it might have been a struggle with a drug problem, as I said before. It could even be a sexual perversion. Do you know that even in church, people are no saved, but there was a time when they used to fight with, with homosexuality or, or lesbianism or just normal heterosexual, you know, man and woman, but they were like perverts. Do you know that there are folks who are saved now that one time they had a drinking problem, they used to be drunkards. Paul speaking to saints said that already, you know, and such were some of you. But no. And he goes on to express that, you know, what has happened. You're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our God. He, so he knows that these are the things that many folks were involved in before they got saved. But understand me now, saints. If these residual areas from the past are not removed, we don't detach them. We don't saw them off and don't make sure they don't swim up back, but saw them off and then move to renew our mind. Brothers and sisters, take my word. The same sexual perversions that we used to do out in the world, after 10 years, after 5 years, after 1 year, after 20 years, they are going to come right back before us because guess what is happening? Listen to remember what I said in the scenes. When Satan captures the mind, if we allow him, then he takes control of the body, he takes control of the emotions. You know that 
sometimes we just smell a certain perfume. And if we are not in God, it takes us back to yesteryear when we might have smelt it on somebody before and it ignites a certain emotion and all of a sudden we start to struggle with this sexual issue that we had 20 years ago with this drinking issue. We, we pass a certain place and they're having a birthday party and you smell a certain fusion Johnny Walker mixed with Pepsi and it have a certain smell and all of a sudden you just feel thirsty like you're going to die if you don't have a drink of that. I don't know if that's ever happened to you but it has happened to many saints one way or the other. There are these residual areas that because we have not allowed ourselves to be solid, become solid in the word. We are unable to renew our minds the right way. And as a result, the strongholds are going to continue to exert power in the life of a Christian. Very important. Now, I am telling you this. These residual areas must be dealt with according to the word of God. It can't be dealt with any other. We can't say, I'm going to build up my willpower. Willpower cannot do this. We can't fight spiritual warfare with fleshy instruments. Yes, we need to have willpower because that is what we're going to use and say we're making up our mind that we're going to walk with God. But then what is the weapon that we are going to use to go into the warfare, which is a spiritual warfare and therefore require a spiritual weapon? Brothers and sisters, I submit to us that we cannot deal with the issues that are going to constantly arise outside of the word of God. Yes? And these are the very same areas. If it was, if when we were, before we were saved, we used to be people that know where the club was. And we would go to the club and have the girls dancing in front of us for the men. Or maybe the other way around also. Yes, if we were the persons that used to be at the bar and we try every kind of mixture and we know the mix, yes, if we were the persons that, you know, whatever it was that we used to do, Satan is very strategic. And what he will do is use the same areas. Anyhow we leave an area, on, that is, and it is not dealt with properly, Satan is going to smell blood and he is going to move to attack us in those areas of our lives that are not surrendered, brothers and sisters. There are folks right now that have been saved for years that are struggling with the flesh. There are folks, and, and I'm talking now, straight talk. There are folks that are fighting with homosexual tendencies. There are folks that are fighting with lesbian tendencies. Because some of the ears that should have been totally severed are not fully surrendered. Why? Because we didn't realize how valuable and how potent the word of God was to our Christian walk and to our staying afloat and to our being more than conquerors. We underestimated the value and the power of the word. But how could we do that when God Almighty himself said that he values his word above his very name and therefore he gave us his word? Is a word him give to heal us, you know? Is a word him give and sanctify us, you know? Is a word him give and give us light, you know? Is his word? And that is the very thing that we have given a low place of priority on our list of things to do. And yet expect to be giants where God is concerned. And know that we look over on somebody else who have given themselves to the word. And we see them advancing. And we see them moving on. And you know, some of us even have the audacity to say that you too spiritual. What kind of thing is, what is happening in church? 
that we can see a man being spiritual and we want to point him out as being too spiritual and you are ahead of us. We should aspire to be like him. I want to be like the most spiritual person. I want to be a giant in the house of God. And anybody that seeks less than that, you have no ambition. We must have ambition to be the best for God. If I am a preacher, I want to be the best preacher. If I am a teacher, I want to be the best teacher. I want to aspire to be the best person where Christianity is concerned. I want to be like Jesus. Ultimately, more of his saving full, more, more about Jesus. That should be so that it is a trick of the enemy to cause a child of God to feel comfortable at a low place when God has made the high ground available to us. And I challenge that spirit and mash down that spirit that will cause any child of God to feel comfortable in mediocrity. Mash that down. That must not be in the vocabulary. It must not be in anything that a child of God would want to accept. It cannot be, it should not be in anything that a child of God would want to accept. For, for every one of us, for every one of us that name the name of Jesus, every one of us that considers ourselves candidates for heaven, it is important that we are clear in our minds that we must be way ahead. We must not be beneath, but we must be above. We must not be looking for Antichrist, but we must be looking for Jesus Christ. Yes, it is important that we establish the mindset that unto them that look for him, will he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The mediocre mindset must be pushed aside. And we must strive for the mastery. We must strive to be giants. And if when we do our assessment, we realize that we are not where we, so we are supposed to be, or where we want to be, or where we know we can be, the desire must chip in to advance in God. How do we take control of our minds again? How do we take control of our walk with God again? It's going to happen by taking control of our minds and mash down those imaginations and tear down those strongholds that have been planted there by Satan because he knows that that is what controls you if he can control the mind and inject what he wants to inject there and if we allow that mind to become a playground for Satan it ought not to be surrender the things that we know and by ourselves, we cannot. When we call upon the Holy Ghost, he will, but he expects us to do something. What is it that we are going to do? When we submit and we surrender all to him, none of us must get up and walk the same again in terms of how we used to walk and ignore the word of God. No man can ignore the, work, the words of Almighty God and advance in the kingdom. No man. The word is crucial. The word is necessary. We said it some time ago. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Necessary. And we have to get into the word. There is no going around the word, saints of God. There is no going around the word, brothers and sisters. We must get in the word. And it is as we know the word and learn the word and walk in the word. It is only then that those things are going to detach themselves from us. Of course, we know about prayer, but we are focusing on the word. Of course, we know about fasting, but we are focusing on the word. You can't pray and don't read the word and don't have the word dwelling richly inside of you, richly inside of us. It cannot happen that we neglect the word. It is too valuable. It means too much to God above his very name. And you and I neglect it. And expect to bask in his presence. It's not going to happen. And I'm talking not only to the 
saints from the assembly that I have responsibility for. My first responsibility is to you. I'm talking to you, and I'm being as plain as possible. But for any other saint anywhere you're from, because nobody can deny, nobody can um, point a finger to say, I am telling you something strange. I am telling you something truthful. And I'm saying to every saint, wherever you are from, that this book is our life, is food. It is what gives us nourishment. It is what causes us to have flesh upon our bones. It is what causes us to have skin over our flesh. It is what gives us vim, vigor, and vitality. It is what gives us energy to do the will of God. We cannot advance in the kingdom and we cannot advance in our relationship with Almighty God if we fail to apply and live in the word, walk in the word. Brothers and sisters, wherever you are, it is as simple and straightforward as that. And I pull no punches. It goes for everybody. And I'm serious as a judge. You're not going to make it. We are not going to make it outside of the word of Almighty God. It is too valuable. It means too much to God for him to give us. And then we avoid it. And still running, hoping to embrace him. We're not going to embrace him without the word. Don't make anybody fool us. It's not going to happen. So I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I lie not. Accept this. No, look back. And I want us to quickly turn back on the, 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 the slide. When the adversary's radar locates an area in our life that is not surrendered to the Lord, he will cease, seize that unsurrendered area. Yes? In our minds or emotions, and he will energize it. Yes? This is why our refusal to deal with specific areas of sin in our lives is where the majority of spiritual warfare stem from. Brothers and sisters, very important point. The areas in our lives that we fail to surrender is where the adversary is going to push and cause the battle to rage. If I was a person that was given in my past life, and when I say past life, before I got saved, was given to alcohol, and I got saved, and there was a tendency, and it was not properly dealt with, because no, don't lie to me. Some folks are drinking alcohol. You're hiding and you're drinking Smirnoff ice. You're hiding and you're drinking Bailey's rum cream. Drinking it, you know. I'm not even talking about taking a bit when people take, put it for preservative in cake, and I'm not even talking that. Drinking it! And hiding behind scriptures, trying to justify it. Well, if you can't justify it in scripture, why you have to hide and drink it? And think nobody don't know. So, don't hide and do it. Because it is going to catch up with you. And you are going to fall right back into a drunken stupor. The adversary sends his radar across, and he knows when we are wounded is surveying all of us through his minions and he knows when unsurrendered areas are there he knows when you are hiding and do he knows don't he i say you know he goes along a particular route because he wants to end up one place but he knows what he's doing in other areas and he knows the the, the, the sinners in zion 
He knows the great pretenders. He knows who is who. And some folks cry and say, oh my God, I am going through a, the worst time of my life. The devil is attempting to sift me like wheat and I don't know what to do. I have seen folks waiting. You know, when it comes to deliverance from areas of weakness, it's not a, an event, you know, where a preacher come and we say, this preacher look like, this look like he's a, a devil chasing preacher. And we say, just come lay hands on me, you know, because I'm going through a, a serious, like, some things are coming back to me that, I can't believe these things. The devil is a liar and the devil is wicked. Of course the devil is a liar and of course the devil is wicked. But all that the devil is doing is using his strategy of identifying the unsurrendered areas in our lives. And when he sees an unsurrendered area because we were not in the world and therefore we never have what was inside to repel you, and, and we're coming, oh Lord, I, the time is going, and I'm, I really want to get to that before I close off, because it's important. And Jesus, when he was tempted, or after he was tempted, the devil came to him. But notice that because the word was inside of him, he had what it took to repel the onslaught and the temptation. Yeah, he had it inside of him, and then he had what it takes, so he could... For, Every temptation, there was a word. A word, you know. I don't care what kind of temptation can come to us, brothers and sisters. And this is why we need to walk in the word and have the word dwelling inside of us richly. Because if it is a temptation in relation to the flesh, homosexuality, lesbianism, fornication, adultery, any one of those kind of things that are sins against the body, there is a word in scripture that if the word was dwelling richly inside of us, we would have had it to repel. Because as we go into further down, we are going to find that the Bible talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word that is translated word there is rima. And we're going to look at what rima means. But you can't have a rima word, which is a specific word about a particular thing if there is not first the word dwelling richly inside of us so we must have the word dwelling richly inside of us and god know is able to pull a particular scripture based on a situation and give a quickening and an anointing and that word becomes a rima word where it is a word from the reservoir of what we have god pulls it and quickens it to the situation to the extent that it can address the situation and we have our reprieve after jesus used the word and repel satan for the three temptation the use of the word three times every temptation there was a word the bible said the devil left him for a season so we are going to have our time when the warfare ease off because nobody will fight forever. You, you push and then there is a break. And then maybe something come up and then push and there is a break. And you're going to have your break. You're going to have your time to bask. But the same time when some people are basking and advancing and glorifying God, there are some that are spiraling down. Because when they should be in the word and walking in the word and expanding themselves in the word. They didn't do it. And so the devil catch a hold of their mind or look for the weak area and raise spiritual warfare in that area and we end up falling. That's how many people fall. The weak, unsurrendered areas were not dealt with and we leave it. I am saying to you tonight, brothers and sisters, let us look at ourselves and deal with the unsurrendered areas. How are we going to do that? We're going to pray. We're going to seek God. We're going to identify them. And we're going to present them. And we are going to get up and decide to walk with our minds renewed. But how are we going to renew, renew our minds? By getting into the word. I want us to look quickly at the next screen. Because I'm running through this quickly now. And I really want us to, the next slide. I really want us to, to catch where it is 
that I'm going and to catch what it is that I'm saying. Uh, Satan knows precisely where to look to find the weak areas, yes, in our lives to use it against us, brothers and sisters. Remember that. Don't lose that out of your mind. We all have weak areas and we all have a responsibility. Yes, I have weak areas. You have weak areas. Every child of God has weak areas. But we have a responsibility to constantly be searching ourselves to introspect and to find those weak areas and then to put them at the cross and then to get into prayer, and then to having gotten up from prayer, to move now, to not go back there anymore. It's going to take a renewed mind, but it's also going to take for that mind to be renewed, getting into the word. Some of the most common open doors that Satan used to gain access into our lives, right, are one, wrong thinking. Two, Wrong believing. Yes. So th these are the things, you know. He injects things into our minds. He's, you see, we must be careful what we say. We must be careful what we make others pour inside of us. So, I, point number one, the wrongful thinking is what people might be telling you or what you might be, Satan might be injecting into your mind. Or when nothing don't go so, be very careful. Wrong believing. Somebody tell you about something about this one. And nothing don't even go so, but you believe it. So your believing is wrong. So you, all of a sudden you start to think this about a particular person when nothing don't go so. But something was presented to you that you jump on. And the Bible speaks about those. When we get to the practical part, we're going to get into those things. But these are the things that Satan uses to captivate our minds because once you start to think wrong about a particular thing or a particular person, once you start to believe wrong about a particular thing or a particular person, uh, Satan is, is opening up, letting loose the ropes in your life through your mind. Then third, fear transferred to us by our parents, our family members, our friends. You know that there are folks who are after 10 years of being saved, they have um, negative self-esteem. And you say, oh, why, why are you like? And they're telling you, look here, my, my friends, them used to say, me go in primary school, them used to say, my workplace, my kids, my mother they used to tell me, my father used to tell me, my brother tell me. And now they are saved. And God was good enough to pour the Holy Ghost inside of them to, to have them born again. But there are something, and this is why, even with the born again experience, you keep hear Paul saying that your mind must be renewed and so forth, because it is important that even as we are saved and we're walking in this new experience, it is important that we know that we must keep ourselves a certain way. Sometimes when we remember terrible experiences that happened before we knew the Lord, they still dominate us. We have flashbacks. Some people were raped before they got saved, you know. And after five, ten years of them getting saved, they now get married. And if them husband going the night when they must consummate their marriage, it can't happen. The memory of the terrible past is still there. And it affects them. These things are real, brothers and sisters. These things are happening. These things are affecting and impacting the lives of saints. They are real. And they are not to be. Why are they there? Somebody didn't understand the importance of the word of Almighty God. Somebody didn't understand the importance of the word. And you, it is very crucial, very crucial that we understand that. Now, look at the scriptures, right? Examine these scriptures. Here is how Paul is talking about the mind. He says the carnal mind which is the natural mind, is enmity against God. Romans 8, verse 7. Mind, you know, he's talking about the mind. He knows the power of the mind. He knows that this is where it is at. He knows that this is where, if we are going to advance or if we are going to recede, things are going to happen in the mind. And it starts out, and I want us to see that the mind, the natural mind, is enmity against God. All right? So here he's now talking to the Colossians. In Colossians 1.21, he says, Prior 
to your salvation experience, you are alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. So he's talking about the mind before one gets saved. So follow me now, you know. So he's talking about the mind. These are carnal mind. This is the natural mind. Enmity against God before you get saved. Prior to your salvation experience, you're alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works that you used to do. So here Paul is talking to these churches and expressing to them uh, this whole business of the mind and of the heart is making it clear that there is something very significant about this member, about the mind, about the heart. And I want you and I, brothers and sisters, to understand it is the things that we think. Why should I prioritize the word of God? That's, so, that's a battle taking place in your mind. But I want to get up and do this first, that first, that first. That's a battle taking place in your mind. Prayer and the word must be first place at all times. Whatever else we are doing, try to have that properly worked out and give it the place of authority and priority and preeminence that it must have. So as we go on, we start to see some other things. Now, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, 17, 18, says the unbeliever, talking about the unbeliever's walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding that being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So here it is, he's talking about um, the vanity of their mind and their understanding, which is the same mind being darkened, and again, the blindness of their heart, heart, mind, that together the recesses is the inside part of us, the deep down part that we can't see, that we can't touch. Mind, heart, sometimes even used interchangeably. And he's saying that it can be blind, vanity, the ignorance that is in them, very important. Now he comes over to the Corinthian church and he's talking and saying the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Yes? And he comes down to the Romans because here he's talking to saints. And as we read through Romans, we find that Paul is admonishing folks to be very careful. Because again, the natural mind can be so contrary to God to the extent that later on, the mind is turned over and becomes reprobate. This is the reason why the authors of the New Testament epistles earnestly plead with us as saints to give serious attention to the condition of our minds because naturally the mind opposes God. So here we have a great salvation experience and God wash us totally. Yes, he wash our minds too, but because of the general nature of the mind, the mind is going to easily revert back to so there is the constant plea and the constant um, admonition to take control of the mind throughout the epistles we are commanded. And this is not the unsaved now. This is not the unregenerate now. Throughout the epistles we are commanded that the we are the saints to renew our minds in the truth of God's word. So here it is that Paul is now writing to the church, the Roman church, and he's saying to them, be ye transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. Here it is that Paul is now writing to the church, brothers and sisters, church people at Ephesus. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man. Put on a new man which is renewed in, in knowledge. When we talk about knowledge, brothers and sisters, we're talking about mind. So this is, this, we are in a battle with the devil over mind control. And that is so crucial. If he gets to control the mind... He controls the person. 
So hear what he said to the Colossians, having spoken to them, having spoken to the others. He said, let the work of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Very, very, wherefore, and this is Peter now talking, gird up the loins of your mind. They, they spoke in terms that the people could understand. And when we talk about girding up the loins of your mind, at least in their time and prior, used to run and carry out their sporting activities a little different from how it is done in the 21st century. Um, they weren't as scantily or skimpily dressed as we see at least today. And they would have some little straps around that they would carry. And sometimes during their race, the straps would fall down across their ankles, you know, below their knees and hamper them. And so sometimes during their race, you would see them shuffling up a little bit to pull up the, you know, girders that fell down and so forth and continue to run. But it hampers them. So Paul was saying, listen, gird up the loins, those things that can easily drop down and hinder you. And he said, the loins of your mind. So he said, make sure that nothing don't hinder you. Things that should not be in your mind, make sure you get them out, that you're not hindered. Things that comes to your mind, things that come into our mind, things that Satan inject there, thoughts that he injects and therefore try to make take root, can be a hindrance and stop us on our way. And so that's how Paul said to the Corinthians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. If we are going to gird up the mind, if we are going to take control of the mind, we have got to let the word. So when we talk about walking in the word, we are talking about something serious that will cause us to either make it in or be left behind. Very, very, very important. I close now because I think we have gone over, but I close with this. I close with this. When the apostle Paul made mention that We have the sword of the Spirit. I believe it's in Ephesians chapter 6. Which is the word of God. He used a particular word for sword. That was different from four of the others that the Roman soldiers use. The Roman soldiers use five different swords. And the one to the Roman soldiers that was most potent is one with a two edge, where the two edges were sharp and the tip pointed up. The tip was so sharp. That sword was not used for defensive purpose it was just offensive so that when they have that it was not to block other swords so they would have their shield for that that sword was for one purpose to go on the offensive to cut left right and center that was a sword that all practically every roman soldier used as their choice 
sword. It had a double edge. When that was pushed into the bowels of uh, an enemy, the practice was to turn it. It sounds gory. And then pull it to ensure that the bowels of the enemy is ripped out. This is the sword. And I'll give you the Greek word when we get back again. Because I want us to see really what Paul meant when he said the sword of the spirit that we have, which is the word of God. And how potent it is. And therefore for us to understand what we are losing out on. When we dare to put the word down, pay scant regard, give no attention, I want us to see the damage that we are doing to ourselves. And that so they turn and pull the bowels out of the enemy. If we are in warfare, we better know, say, in the same way that Satan is attacking us, we need to be attacking him. And our only offensive weapon, that's the weapon that we use to run down the enemy, is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And this is the one that we put on and therefore have nothing to attack with. And therefore we are exposed. And that is the reason why many are going through what they are going through. Why many are in a state of backsliding. Why many have been turned over by the enemy. Because we have treated lightly, have put down the sword of the spirit. Which is an offensive weapon. Which is the very word of God. I can't go any more. I am told that my time is up. And God's willing, next week we pick up from here. And once we get to understand clearly the strategy of the warfare, which we have been going through, and how we can safeguard ourselves against being run over by Satan, the adversary, it puts us in a position to advance powerfully and to take our rightful place as overcomers and more than conquerors. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, we come before your great and your awesome presence. We thank you again, mighty God, for what we are learning about the words, new thoughts, but they were always there. But we are just rolling them out so that the people of God, all of us, can be uh, blessed thereby and blessed therefrom. I pray, mighty God, that you will help us to hold on to these words, to see exactly where and how the battle is raging, and therefore to understand what it is that we need to do to make sure that we are overcomers, which you intend us to be, because you already won the victory when you died on Calvary. Help us to realize that although... We were once bound. The shackles have been removed. Hallelujah. Through your work on Calvary. And we need to just understand that. And to get up and to fight our way. And to push into the victory which is already ours. Grant unto us this understanding almighty God. Grant unto us a heart that desire to read your word. And help us to read and to embrace it. And then to live in it, to walk in the word. Bless this Bible study series, I pray. Bless your people. Help us to be strong, to be more than conquerors. I present every one of your people to you tonight. Hold us, lead us, guide us, and bless us. I give you thanks right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Um, saints of the Most High God. We are happy that you joined us this evening uh, for another Bible study. And we look forward to us being here again next week. We go into the Greek words, look at the heart 
of where those, so those swords are coming from. And why Paul used the particular word for the sword that he used in that scripture. He was sending us a strong signal. He was sending us a message. And we need to see what that message was and is and work with that. Very important. And we're going to look at the word from the Greek that is there as word, which is rima. And we're going to see what that means. We cannot afford to miss Bible study because this is overcoming time for every child of God. God bless you. Before I go, uh, remember now, Sunday coming, we are going to be going into two shifts, two services this Sunday. We will be having service at 9 for group one. Then at 11 o'clock, 11.30, I'm sorry, at 11.30, the second service, yes, the second service will be on and that will be for group two. So this coming Sunday, we will be having two shifts, two services, nine o'clock, group one, and then 11.30, group two. Now, here is what we wanted to do for Sunday school. And I'm so sorry that I am here and did not get clearly. And I, I take responsibility for that because something was worked out. But we need to have some of our Sunday school students coming out to Sunday school. Um, yes, something was done in relation to discussing and coming up with a solution for that. I will have that information through a voice note sent to all of us very shortly. I just need to get a bit of clarification on two things and we will have exactly what will happen for Sunday where Sunday school is concerned in terms of a few of the students coming out. So we will give you that information and uh, you will have that by way of a voice note. All right? And we sh certainly should have that for you. If not tomorrow evening, certainly by Friday. But it will be clear at that time and I will send a voice note out and we see as best as we can to get it around to everybody else. But also, for those that are new converts just recently been saved new converts we will have young converts new converts class officially starting this sunday it's not a big group so we know exactly how and where we will house you to maintain the social distancing and also to ensure that you know, we are in conformity with all the protocols as outlined by the government due to the COVID-19 situation. So bear that in mind. And all new converts, you are asked to be out this Sunday. And by tomorrow or Friday, we will send a voice note out so that we know how we are going to treat with Sunday school uh, for the rest of uh, our Sunday school students because we are going to be doing it by groups with your parents but exactly how it will um, be rolled out we will give you that information and remember no mask no entry we are going 100% in terms of following the protocol and we ask if you are bringing visitors remind them of their masks but every saint have your mask no mask no entry very important. The Lord bless you. Thank you so much. God's wonderful people to all the visitors. God bless you. Good to have all of us in Bible study this evening. And I pray that our hearts will be challenged and we will move to walk in the word. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.